Okay, well, thank you uh, so much for uh, being here. We want to be on time. So uh, as you know, this is the biannual report that the International Monetary Fund puts out. We're going to focus in a lot of detail on the European uh, economy. We're hosted, of course, by the Belgian National Bank. So we're joined by the central banker of the Belgian National Bank, and he's going to open the session for us. And of course, is uh, Pierre Wunsch, who's going to join us now and do introductory remarks for this report. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Uh, we, we like, well, I don't have a lot of room to put my papers here, but uh, I'll, I'll manage. We like this confusion about Brussels and Brussels, you know, one being the capital of Belgium, Flanders and the Brussels region, and one being the capital of Europe. So I think it's uh, uh, a pleasure, but, uh, but also an honor uh, to, to host uh, today the IMF to make this uh, uh, this presentation on, on their uh, uh, European product. So, um, of course, most of you are familiar with the world economic outlook, but the pretension of Brussels would stop there. And so again, uh, today it's about it's about the European outlook. Um, so the the world one uh, is, of course, the flagship one, and it's twice a year. Um, but but it's also relevant because it sets uh, the stage for uh, the high level meetings that we go uh, to uh, among the world central bankers and finance ministers. And so that's setting the scene at a very high level. And today we, we go down one step. And and of course, the world economy is diverse. We know that. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's also interesting, and that's I think really a value added of the IMF that beyond this this worldview that they provide, they also go through the specificities and more tailored analysis of uh, some uh, areas in the world, and of course that's what they are going to to do today. Um, so although the IMF report covers much more uh, than the European Union, uh, Brussels, uh, and I just said it, uh, remains a very natural place to launch. Um, it's official publication on Europe, and so I'm, I'm again very happy uh, that you, that you are here today. Uh, the European economy is at a crossroads. Uh, that's that's easy to say, but it implies actually a lot of things. On the one hand, we seem uh, to to be set for a soft landing in the short term. Um, this is really a story of a succession of crises uh, that have been hitting the European economy, but it's also a story of resilience, uh, and especially on the labour market front. Uh, the economy has been doing much better than we thought. Uh, and so it remains quite difficult sometimes to read uh, what's what's really taking place. So in the economic jargon, uh, uh, what we see today is, is a gradually uh, declining inflation without re recession, nor mass uh, unemployment. So this is this the soft landing that we are uh, aiming at. But uh, of course, this is uh, good news, but on the other hand, uh, there are still uh, very clear you know, challenges uh, uh, ahead piling up, uh, and that is maybe uh, less good news. Um, after the spike in inflation that marked uh, the year 2022, uh, the rapid tightening of monetary policy has been doing its job, yes, uh, and we know that it has a negative impact on the economy in a way that's what we, we, we have to aim for. So uh, inflation has now been falling relatively rapidly uh, for a number of, uh, of months. And, and part of it is uh, automatic and exogenous. It's not related to monetary policy, but to uh, the normalization of energy prices that have spiked in 22 and then, and then crashed. Uh, but the rest uh, we would uh, claim uh, at the ECB level is indeed uh, largely probably the result uh, from uh, central bank's action and that that uh, is also the case probably in the in the UK and in the US. And in, inevitably again a growth came down as aggregate supply and demand uh, rebalanced. Remarkably though the labor market and I just mentioned it but has remained very resilient. And there uh, again uh, you have this discussion whether it's labor holding at some point it's just going to stop and crash but you know, so far so good, uh, um, and and we know also there are structural demographic uh, trends. Uh, you know, that are supporting this very tight uh, labor market. This has allowed nominal wages to catch up uh, with past inflation without triggering second round effects. So so there are um, 
of course, not a wage price spiral, but still what we see is catching up uh, in nominal wages, which is for us Belgium important because you know we have automatic indexation. So that so this good reason on on this inflation front um, uh, with this hope for a soft landing is is one part of the story, uh, and that's the reassuring part of the story. But of course, uh, I mentioned there are risks uh, around the baseline, and they are unusually large, and that has been the case for a while now. Uh, and they're probably tilted towards higher inflation, especially if we would uh, look at the situation in the Middle East and consider possible impact on oil prices and maybe gas prices. Uh, and they're probably tilted to the to downside when we look at growth. So yes, remember the word uh, stagflation. Uh, we are entering some weak form of stagflation. Uh, we're probably in it right now. Of course, inflation is going down. We hope that growth is going to pick up. So it's only going to be a weak form of it, but still. Uh, and we have to talk about geopolitical tensions. Uh, they are everywhere. Uh, you know, if we look at energy prices, uh, which are probably bound to remain volatile. And yes, um, policy mistakes uh, could uh, be made or can be made. Uh, my impression, my take on that one is that it becomes ever more difficult in those balkanized political environments that we see, uh, that used to be specific to Belgium, but that we see all over Europe now, right now, it becomes ever more difficult to tackle uh, medium to long term issues. We, we can still muddle through us, it's, you know, if there is a shock, but uh, dealing with this uh, medium to long term issue becomes uh, ever more difficult. So in that regard, I think the IMF report contains a very explicit warning for us, also central bankers, that we should not declare victory against inflation too soon, uh, which is music to my ears. And indeed, in the IMF view, it is better to err on the side of lowering uh, interest rates a bit too late rather uh, than too soon. And, and I said it also, I think there is some asymmetry. If we would get good news on the inflation front, you know, getting to 2.25 is still a long way. So uh, let's not get excited. Of course, if we would have bad news on the upside, uh, we would have to do more. But that that uh, is has become less likely again unless we have uh, a shock uh, on the energy front. But there are also longer term challenges, um, which also uh, don't leave room for complacency. More persistent and more volatile inflation could uh, become a durable part of the economic landscape in the coming years. And again, geopolitical fragmentation and climate change are the two major concerns. And together with population aging, uh, they call for deep structural reforms and difficult policy choices. I had just had this morning lunch with uh, Belgian CEOs uh, and those that are related to the energy incentive sectors are really, really worried of the double whammy shock of higher gas prices and, and the ambition of Europe on the climate front, which I fully support but which um, compared to what's taking place in the US with a lot of subsidies makes it uh, difficult. So I'm not going to spoil the presentation of the report. I, I wouldn't be able to do it, by the way, but uh, achieving the desirable policy mix uh, in Europe will require a restrictive monetary and fiscal stances, as well as growth enhancing reforms. In the past, those reforms have proven to be politically very difficult to put in place. And I think this, this is ever more the case. Uh, and, and yet, in, uh, if Europe is set to grow at a satisfactory pace, it must improve the supply side of its economy. So it's going to be ever more about reform, ever more about potential growth. Uh, it is the key to boost productivity, improve labor market participation, um, and reach also uh, the goals that I just mentioned that are ambitious on the, ambitious on the climate front. The fall uh, 2023 regional economic outlook provides, uh, we believe, a convincing narrative, putting these different elements uh, together. And I strongly uh, encourage everyone interested in the European economy, and you're here, but uh, indeed to read it and to listen to the presentation that will be made. So uh, I will leave you with one concern related to the political economy of reforms and fiscal consolidation. It is a fact that political leaders often end up uh, making hard choices when crisis put their back uh, against the wall. Uh, uh, we were in Greece for the, the last governing council meeting, and there is this narrative uh, going on in Europe that the way we dealt with the previous crisis, you know, the euro crisis was the bad one, it was way too harsh, uh, way too, too socially costly. And of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, points uh, taken there, but when you look at Ireland, when you look at Greece, when you look at Portugal, 
the countries that went through these programs, they are doing fine. And some others that haven't gone through these programs are not uh, doing sometimes uh, fine. So I think we, we, we need maybe to, to go back to the narrative about uh, what we went through. Um, and in fact, in that regard, the benign short term outlook is, is maybe not good news uh, for the ambitious reforms that we need. Uh, and the fact that, that we've modeled through and that our economy is being uh, resilient has allowed for a number of these issues to be uh, to be postponed and, 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 and reforms to be uh, uh, backtracked. Um, and this is even more relevant that the legacy of the recent crisis left many uh, in the public, in public opinion, with a feeling that, you know, uh, public budgets are limitless, that uh, money was very cheap, uh, free, uh, and that uh, every time there is a shock that someone should deal with the shock and that it should not be having any impact uh, or uh, an impact that would be as, as limited as possible for people. And history showed that this um, is not true, that it's not possible for, you know, every shock to put one trillion on the table. Uh, so let me hope um, that we will not rediscover uh, this the hard way, but I guess to some extent the report that is going to be presented now by uh, the IMF and by you uh, is, is going to be about that. So uh, not about the way not to go about it, but the way to go about it. So the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Governor Munch, for the opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Xavier, for hosting us. Um, Appreciate uh, the audience uh, here and online for our report. Uh, if I may start with uh, borrowing a phrase uh, of your opening remarks, uh, so far so good is also the theme uh, and probably a fair assessment of where Europe is right now. Uh, Europe has largely overcome the COVID and the war inflicted energy price shocks from last year, uh, but the twin shocks uh, have left their marks. Uh, the current uh, slowdown will be overcome, but what uh, uh, Europe faces is, is slower medium term growth. And in choosing the topic and theme for this report, we have juxtaposed the restoring price stability in the title with securing and strong and green growth, which are intertwined. So let's go and look at the growth slowdown. Uh, it's uh, slowing across Europe as the lagged effects of high inflation suppressed demand. I think that's a still a present momentum. And also central banks have uh, raised interest rates. So nothing new there. Uh, looking a little bit deeper by uh, sub regions, uh, which are the different bars in the left chart, you see heterogeneity across uh, uh, countries in Europe. Southern European countries have fared better and uh, slightly probably due to tourism. Uh, on the other hand, the, as uh, mentioned earlier, more manufacturing and energy intensive uh, countries such as Germany, uh, countries uh, in Central, Eastern, Southeastern uh, Europe uh, have hit harder by the decline in goods demand. Uh, what about the latest trends? Uh, so if you look at the right hand side, this is the flash GDP data that was released just a week ago and it shows that the euro area slowed further. Um, if you take out the volatile series for Ireland, which is the second uh, bar, you see that the orange point is very, very close to where the actual numbers came in. So the downswing is, or the slowdown in growth is quite close to what we predicted. Um, let me just um, uh, also point out that uh, the external environment uh, provides, in our view, neutral momentum to the outlook. Strong growth in the US on the one hand is a positive force. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look at China and domestic uh, problems related to the real estate sector, uh, there is less momentum from this side, and these two forces uh, offset each other for Europe as a whole. Uh, the other uh, element, of course, is inflation. It uh, remains the key priority uh, for Europe to restore price stability. Uh, headline inflation uh, has declined rapidly, is a steep mountain climb and drop off on the left hand side. Uh, but what you see is that the core elements, those without energy and commodity prices, 
have uh, moved much slower and the uh, deceleration in the core part, especially in services, are still very slow. Uh, one item could be that the tourism uh, has only normalized this year, so there is maybe was still some backup demand. Another reason is the very resilient labor market and with wage growth having accelerated feeding into inflation. Uh, this is one part we look at very carefully in chapter two of our report, and uh, I'll speak to it when we uh, discuss risks that also shapes our policy uh, advice. Now to the outlook. Uh, so our forecast is shaped by two opposing forces. On the one hand, uh, we have synchronized tightening of monetary policy, credit and the price of risk, which in combination will weigh on aggregate demand, and that's intentional as they're meant to bring down inflation. Uh, we also expect that fiscal policy is mildly contractionary for this year and next year, which will also take out some demand momentum. On the other hand, as inflation uh, decelerates and wages rise, you have uh, uh, an increase in real incomes and domestic demand starting to outpace inflation. This will be the upside momentum. Uh, a positive supportive element uh, for households is that they have ample excess savings, which they have accumulated during the pandemic. And if they not spend it, they at least are a comfortable buffer for confidence. Uh, so what is our forecast? Overall, we uh, still forecast a soft landing, but this we mean a slowdown this year that is not a recession and a mild recovery next year. Specifically advanced uh, European economies expected to grow by 0.7%, emerging markets 2.4% this uh, year, and then followed by two mild recoveries in both regions. Headline uh, will continue to fall, but in contrast core uh, is declining more slowly. You see the flatter shape in the middle chart. Uh, in particular, in emerging markets, uh, the slowdown is uh, in, in inflation is uh, more uh, uh, dragged out, uh, partially to do the sustained wage growth. Um, as a result, inflation targets are not to be expected to be reached before 2025. And uh, we see uh, though in our baseline, that uh, this is uh, uh, an attainable uh, goal. Uh, we wanted to bring in the medium term outlook as well into this discussion as defeating inflation is closely linked to remaining competitive. Uh, from a longer term perspective, uh, growth prospects have declined. Our forecast for the outer years, 2027, 2028, shows slower growth than in previous periods and the combination of COVID and energy price increases have been a strong uh, headwind that are now already seen in low productivity growth. On top of this we see fragmentation and climate change adding to these new challenges. Um, some of this as we uh, as you uh, mentioned um, was uh, will create new markets and opportunities but they're also going to be uh, a large uh, potential also to render existing economic uh, structures and activities obsolete. And so these transitions over the medium term need to be well managed. So what are the risks uh, that we see? Two immediate ones uh, are the growth could be slower and there are indications that in quarter four, for example, growth could be slower as a result of uh, less private uh, activity. Uh, the purchasing uh, managers market uh, managers index is uh, one uh, source uh, for this concern, and it could indicate that the slowdown spreads to services which have been very strong so far. Uh, another uh, reason for a uh, risk is uh, ge new geopolitical risks, uh, the Middle East conflict, 
uh, has the potential to raise energy prices again. On the right hand side, you'll see that energy prices have oil prices have largely stay, stayed stable since October 6, a mild uptick. Uh, but this is, of course, no assurance that it might uh, uh, prevail. Uh, and finally, wages uh, could also rise faster and longer than we have assumed in our baseline forecast. And this could be the result of the tight labor markets and wage setting patterns, which we have explored in our uh, analysis. So sustained high wage growth without the underpinning of productivity growth could feed into inflation. So what is our uh, forecast uh, for wage growth? Uh, we have looked at the traditional determinants of wage growth. These are tightness of the labor market, wage catch up, productivity growth, and first found that they are quite well explained wage setting, uh, which is quite different between the advanced economies and the emerging European countries. So in developed Europe, uh, current wage growth of about 5% this year and developing towards three and a half in 2025 would be consistent with inflation coming down. Uh, but with wages uh, in uh, advanced economies slower to catch up to inflation and those still tight labor markets, there could be a drawn up catch up uh, of wages, which could uh, uh, then feed into inflation. The situation is slightly different in emerging uh, Europe, where wage growth traditionally has been higher because productivity has been higher. Uh, the wage setting is uh, similarly determined by the tightness, and that's a common uh, phenomenon of the labor market, but also by uh, a wage setting process that is more backward looking in uh, economic jargon, meaning it is influenced more by recent inflation experiences. And here uh, one can worry that uh, this wage growth continues for longer and um, uh, feeds uh, into competitiveness losses. Uh, we expect uh, wages of 10% uh, or around 10% this year going down to 6, 6.5% 6 is consistent with the current inflation uh, targets. So we ran a plausible adverse scenario to see uh, what uh, is a potential wage growth inflation effect based on these historical patterns. And lo and behold, uh, the outcome would be that uh, inflation targets would likely be achieved one year later. So on the one hand, this could uh, be meaning competitive losses uh, for emerging uh, Europe or tighter the need for tighter monetary policy. So these are uh, the two uh, uh, risks that uh, we have looked at on the inflation side, commodities and wages. Uh, growth slowdown is a balanced risk on the downside uh, for inflation. Uh, what other things do we worry about? If we weren't the IMF, we wouldn't worry about other things. So um, uh, another adverse scenario characterized by low growth and inflation uh, is financial stability. Bank stress tests um, identify sizable capital losses in a wide set of banks under such a downside scenario, and it could lower um, capital um, buffers by two to three percentage points. Uh, in some banks, uh, the tier one ratio could fall below the regulatory threshold. This is on the left hand side. Uh, on the fiscal side, uh, you could also uh, assess the implications of higher inflation and low growth uh, by looking at the implications for debt dynamics. High inflation tends to be, at least in the short term, beneficial for lower debt ratios, but um, over time, lower growth, as well as the higher interest rates associated would raise that. And we have quantified this by a higher probability of debt ratios not falling of about 20 to 30 percent, which is uh, a non negligible amount. So let me come to the last part of my presentation on policies. Uh, we think monetary policy is appropriately tight in major central banks. 
And uh, we assume in our baseline that uh, banks will remain, uh, central banks will remain restrictive policies throughout 2024 uh, in order to restore price stability. That's the assumption in our baseline. The risks to the inflation outlook go in both directions. I just went and mentioned them earlier. And uh, indeed, uh, historically, uh, there have been episodes of disinflation where um, it turns out that it takes a long time for uh, disinflation to materialize. So when assessing uh, the risks for policy, our view is uh, the cost of monetary policy being too tight is smaller than being too loose and uh, 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 easing too early would be costly. Now, central banks have already undertaken sufficient tightening. These are the blue bars on the right hand side and most of them have uh, uh, achieved positive real policy rates. These are the red dots. Uh, and in a few cases where the current monetary policy stance is loose, we uh, still recommend raising policy rates uh, so they can uh, restore uh, inflation. So this is a statement about uh, all central banks. Um, so more consolidation uh, on the fiscal side uh, is needed. Uh, and the good news is that public finance is actually already move in the right direction. Expir expiration of extraordinary support measures is uh, one big momentum, and you can see that it's in advanced um, economies where we project that the deficits will fall below thresholds where debt is stabilized. In our view, it's important though that all countries strengthen their um, adjustment, uh, adjustment efforts and uh, three reasons uh, to build buffers. We are in a more uh, shock prone world uh, and to reduce debt, which has uh, risen precariously in some cases uh, in Europe. Uh, on this point, I think it's important for the European Union to find an agreement on a revised uh, new fiscal framework as it would send a strong signal about the commitment uh, for the uh, Union. So how to best approach these tasks, uh, especially in emerging uh, uh, economies, there's a significant room still to mobilize resources. Uh, and these need to be not just to broad by, uh, broad by, uh, bring down uh, debt, but also to uh, fund uh, important infrastructure in greening um, expenditures. How is that to be done? Lots of efficiency gains can be achieved through better targeting and, and better spending prioritization. So it's uh, on the expenditure side and there is uh, potential to improve uh, revenue without raising rates. Higher tax efficiency especially could uh, yield up to three and a half percent of GDP in uh, emerging Europe. So there's uh, some work that uh, offers uh, promise to help with fiscal adjustment. On the financial sector, uh, we uh, think that uh, financial sector policies need to preemptively address pockets of financial strains. Bank profits were boosted, uh, and these were boosted by the rising net interest margin margins. Uh, at the same time, the quality of bank, bank credit portfolios are deteriorating, uh, especially in the real estate uh, sector where housing and commercial real estate uh, prices and uh, the quality of uh, credits have fallen. So this is both a role for supervision, but also using those profits to uh, increase capital buffers. This can be done through regulatory measures, but it can also uh, be done through um, uh, other measures letting um, uh, banks uh, enhance uh, their uh, buffers uh, without measures and uh, avoiding though withdrawing uh, these additional sources through windfall taxes, which we think would be a wrong response. Let me come to, to my final slide. Um, bringing the discussion back to uh, the need to raise growth in Europe. Restoring price stability is 
a precondition, but it cannot create growth by itself. Uh, Europe has entered both COVID as well as the energy price shock with already weak productivity growth. That's a problem that existed before, and the list of actions to do so are well known. Uh, what can then countries do at the national level? Uh, they vary, but many need to improve training and job matching. After all, it's the human capital uh, that we need to build, and demographics is moving away from us. So enhancing labor supply through better training is an important element. Um, also in European emerging markets, and that's on the very right hand side, uh, capital stocks are still comparatively low. So there it's important that governments a, build infrastructure, but also attract foreign direct investment. And this will uh, require cuts in red tape and also combating corruption. At the Europe-wide level, uh, I think it's important that uh, Europe protects its most important growth assets. It's the single market. Fragmentation threatens to raise costs and disrupt production. But uh, in Europe, you have a single market which can be a buffer to absorb uh, many changes if it's integrated and open as uh, firms and households and workers can move and adjust in a unified uh, way. So progress on further integration of services, banking and capital markets is needed more than ever. So I'll leave you with uh, uh, the key messages. Uh, overall, policies are moving in the right direction, but the way ahead contains short-term risks and of course, uh, medium-term challenges of bringing growth back. So with that, I hand over to you. Devin, thank you so much. And uh, the presentation is online, so everyone can uh, read it in detail. And again, thank you to uh, Pierre, who is uh, the head of the Belgian National Bank and also sits at the ECB. The journalist in me wants to ask you what's going to happen in December, but maybe that's a question for another day. I don't want to uh, put you on the spot, but if you want, you can answer. Um, and now we move into uh, our panel. And before we move into the panel, just to explain, uh, we will do 20 minutes of my questions going into this report. And then after, I will hand the floor to you. So if there are questions, all you need to do is put your hand up, say who you are, and then address uh, the question. And then after, we can continue the discussion because there's going to be uh, tea and coffee right here. So stay with us, uh, please. It'll be it'll be fun, I promise. And now, uh, I'm joined to my right by Helga Berger, who is uh, Deputy Director at the International Monetary Fund. I'm also joined by Xavier De Bruyne, who is the Head of Economics Research at the National Bank of Belgium. And I'm also joined, well, further to my right by Kunda Luz, who is the Chief Economist at BNP Paribas Fortis. Um, I'm going to put the first two questions uh, to you, which is, uh, we've heard the view from the IMF. We've also heard, interestingly enough, too, from, from Pierre, some of the downside risks and the entire presentation. I wonder, do you agree fundamentally with the picture they paint? Where do you agree? And if not, where do you see things perhaps slightly different? Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's uh, really nice to be uh, to be here in such a distinguished panel. Um, I think, you know, um, we all agree that times are fun, are really uncertain right now. And uh, I think we all agree mostly on the sources of risk, external risks, uh, and uh, also um, uh, risks related to potential side effects of monetary policy actions, uh, especially in the real estate market. We know that many people are worried about that. Uh, what I would like simply to emphasize now is the, the kind of risks that we as economists are sometimes at uh, difficulty to to properly articulate and which which are not really discussed. I mean, yeah, I mean, there are some discussions of those risks, but what I have in mind is the the policy risk. I mean, the risk of making policy mistakes. I mean, when you don't see where you're going, which is uh, pretty much the situation we're in right now, it's very difficult to be a forecaster. Uh, you're also more likely to make mistakes. And uh, the IMF has a very strong piece of advice on monetary policy. And they say, essentially, 
you know, in these uncertain times, you should err on the side of being too tight rather than uh, trying to loosen too quickly, which is one important piece of advice. Uh, on fiscal policy, we don't quite know. I mean, fiscal policy has a commitment problem. Uh, it's been emphasized also by Stefan when he mentioned the fact that we really needed to have more, uh, more of a clear view of what the new fiscal framework would be uh, for uh, the European Union, the new rules, the new stability and growth pact. Uh, and uh, currently we have a feeling that fiscal policy is a little bit unmoored. You know, it's like a ship that doesn't go in the right direction. Uh, sustainability is not guaranteed. And, um, and there, uh, the risk is that because we uh, come out of two important crises, two massive crises, COVID and the energy uh, price crisis, uh, there is a feeling that, you know, the state budget is limitless that somehow the state budget can insure any uninsurable risk uh, and that uh, because public debt can keep rising without apparently causing any concern anywhere, uh, we should actually be relying or continue to rely, to rely on, uh, on, on state budgets. And this is, this is a significant risk of uh, making further uh, uh, policy uh, mistakes. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say about those policy risks is that, the, you know, what I like very much about the narrative in the in the regional economic outlook is this kind of tension between a short term, which is relatively nice looking and a longer term, which is very challenging. And when you have that, if you think in terms of political economy, uh, it's a, it's a disaster because if you don't feel the urge to actually do something, which is currently the narrative we hear because it's about a soft landing and everything will go fine and oh, the labor market is resilient, so no mass unemployment in sight. Uh, you know, the incentive is usually to do nothing because the decisions you have to make in terms of structural reforms are difficult decisions with deep distributive implications. And this is politically very complicated. Uh, on the other hand, there is a, another risk, which is the risk of doing too much. Because uh, if you look at climate policies, you say, oh, my God, I mean, you know, we need to do to do things on on, uh, on that side. And when you think about, you know, the basic economics of things, uh, you look at prices and you look at quantities and you might want to say, well, let's have the implicit price of carbon rise until we actually have a consumption of carbon or uh, carbon emissions, which are actually where we think they should be to be at net zero. Uh, the, the fact is that if you do this, if you rely only on prices, uh, you will create intractable political problems because this is a regressive tax. This is a tax that has very uneven consequences for different categories of people. And all, very often the less affluent people in societies are those who will be most affected by that. So the political economy of this is, is complicated. Therefore, governments will think about acting on quantities, and this is called regulation. You were, were going to ban cars that are not electric. OK, let's do this. OK, you just kill the quantity. And that's one way to do this. No price involved there. It's central planning at its best. Uh, the thing is that uh, there, there is a temptation to overdo it. And uh, what we are not clear about, and we're working on it at the National Bank, but what we're really not clear about right now are the trade-offs between these different policy instruments. It's extremely difficult for everybody who is trying to think seriously about the issue to come up with a policy package that actually makes sense. And there again, you have a risk that because we don't know the trade-off, uh, we're going to try to overdo it on certain regulations and therefore increase the cost of that climate transition and not doing enough on, on other parts. So in terms of risks, uh, you know, the risk of policy mistake, I, I see it as very high right now. And as the governor mentioned, of course, that's not even mentioning uh, the, uh, the very difficult uh, poll. I mean, we have fragmentation. He spoke about balkanization, but we also have extreme polarization. Uh, there is a hollowing out of the, the center in the political spectrum, and uh, that is making, uh, you know, good policies much harder to design and to implement. Well, thank you for that. I, I think you were very a realist in a lot of the issues that you mentioned in the sense that you hear this repeatedly in Brussels. The trade-offs, you don't know what they are, but more difficult, you don't know what the right trade-offs would be that you can sell to the public opinion. 
as, as the right balance. I don't think anyone has an answer uh, for that yet. So, uh, well, maybe some will say gloomy or realistic. You know, you, you, you decide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, of course, is there uh, anything there? Were, I know you wanted to talk about competitiveness too in yes. in Europe because that's maybe a factor that helps. Uh, uh, let's hope so. Uh, but first of all, um, I would say that we agree to a large extent to uh, the picture that has been um, given by the IMF. The lowest, the last mile is the hardest when it comes to inflation. That is. That is clear if we've uh, had the easy wins like low energy prices, improving supply chains. I think we, we're going to see cuts uh, starting in the, let's say, in, in the second, no, in the first half of next year, 2024. I think as well, uh, when we look to rates that uh, even if we have these cuts, we are still in an environment where uh, rates are both neutral. And I think we will stay in that environment, certainly until, let's say, the second half of 2025. So that is our provision, uh, that is our uh, vision. Uh, I think as well in the long term that we're going to enter a new era, a new era which is completely different from the era we had over the past 10, 20 years. Um, um, I always want to make a little bit of publicity, so I'm going to do that uh, when I'm going to uh, publish my new book, The New World Economy. Uh, I, I do uh, I have done a study on the five main trends uh, uh, which are multi-globalization. It's not deglobalization, it's multi-globalization. You have as well climate transition, you have aging, you have high government debt and you have innovation. All these things, except for innovation, of course, is pushing inflation a little bit higher compared to the past 20 years. And I think that is important, uh, certainly for enterprises to, to, to realize that we're not going uh, to come back to this uh, interest rates that are, let's say, even below 1%. I think if we talk about neutral interest rates, uh, probably uh, in, in Europe, we will have to look uh, between uh, one and a half. I, interest rates will hover at around one and a half and 4% neutral rates somewhere around two, two and a half percent. But that is something that really they have to, um, yeah, they have to realize. And of course, yeah, it means then that your return on assets or return on equity should be a little bit higher as well. And then we come to the productivity part. Productivity part, where I think as well that um, in a broader sense, if you look to the European situation, where you see that you have weak growth and sticky inflation, uh, one element of the sticky inflation is as well uh, an element of a negative supply shock. And of course, if you increase your productivity growth, you're going to uh, eliminate a little bit this negative supply shock and maybe you can uh, diminish this uh, inflation part as well. Now, I want to tackle this uh, competitiveness part a little bit by looking at what makes companies decide to invest in Europe. Why do they invest in Europe and why not? Because Indeed, uh, a better single market, as the IMF pointed out, is uh, very important. More spending on research and development is important. But what does companies may decide, make decide to invest in Europe or not? And, and, and if we can tackle these things, then I think we can increase in uh, competitiveness as well. And if you look at that and you see quality of human capital is, uh, is, is on their mind. If you look at that, you see innovation capacity is a challenge. They think tax regimes, regulatory environment, and of course, energy prices, which are very, very high. Now, just to see how is Europe tackling this, I think they are starting to tackle this. And this is because of everything that has happened uh, with, with the war in, in, in Ukraine. You see as well, all of, all of a sudden, it's uh, energy security that's uh, yeah, very top of mind. And uh, because of that, you have this green industrial plan. And in this green industrial plan, one of the things that Europe wants to do is to upgrade the skills of available labor, which is what the IMF is advising as well. I think that is already one element that is very important. Second element, simplify the regulatory environment. If you look today, it's all too, so complex as well. Licenses, if you want to open mines, it's a process of eight to 12 years in Europe. Now, that is way too long for companies to start to invest in this uncertainty. And if the Net Zero Industry Act is adopted in the current forum, yeah, this would be reduced to 18 months. And that is, of course, a big leap forward. 
Of course, uh, do other regions do better? I don't think so. If you look to uh, the US, they do as, as bad as, as Europe. But if you look then to the plan that you uh, that the US has launched the inflation reduction plan, then everybody says, uh, and then European companies say, "Wow, well, what a plan! It's great." While if you look to how much money is spent to the next generation EU plan, I think we spend at least as much money as the Inflation Reduction Act. Of course, it depends how much at the end of the day is going to be spent because yeah, it's in fact unlimited this inflation, re uh, inflation reduction plan. But why do these companies think that still the IRA is much more interesting than the next generation EU plan? Yeah, because it's so difficult. It's so to, to get these subsidies in Europe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for big companies, let alone for small companies, because if you want to have these subsidies uh, in your national uh, state, well, for small companies, they, they don't have the labor force to 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 do that. And, and that is, of course, something that is that is yeah, troubling. And, and there we still have a long way to go to simplify all these procedures. And if you simplify all these procedures, I'm pretty sure that investments are going to follow, that that productive investments are going to follow and that the productivity is going to increase. One last element. And of course, there is the huge difference in energy prices. And there you have the regulatory environment plus the regulatory environment. Then, um, uh, yeah, as, as, as IMF and, and the National Bank of Belgium said, yeah, okay, this is this is pushing companies away from Europe, and so we have a big risk that regulatory environment is too, yeah, too strict uh, in in Europe. And and yeah, it's difficult to say that because we want to be the first, but if you want to first, uh, be the first. Uh, Often you get a knock on your face as well. The first one to get a knock on your face and you, you don't want that. So I think even with regards to this uh, energy prices, there is hope today. The difference in energy prices, gas price is four times. We pay four times more in LNG. It came from 10. It's a little bit better, but OK, it's not something that, that you can say, wow, this is great. But if you see to the huge planned investments in, in 25 LNG terminals and in carriers in Europe, I think what this will do is turn a regional LNG market a little bit more in a global LNG market. And so this will reduce the difference in gas prices between the United States and Europe. And a second element is that yeah, the more renewable energy that is in the mix, the more that you will see as well that the total energy price difference will uh, will come down as well. Not all will be renewable energy, but if you have renewable energy, you have independence as well. You're not so dependent on other countries anymore. And if you can reduce that dependency, yeah, and then I think that the difference in total energy prices, although you have still a higher gas price, the total difference in energy prices will diminish as well. And with all these things that I said, I think that uh, we can say that, OK, in Europe, Times are very, very challenging, but if I look on the long term, uh, if we turn words into deeds, I think we can cut out at the, uh, we can come out at it better than uh, how we entered this phase. Can I just ask you very briefly, a very honest answer. If, if you were a company now, would you, in, in the case that you, and, and I know you put forward solutions and what you think would perhaps fix the, the differential or at least the perceived differential between one region and another. If you were a company now in Europe, would you would you still invest uh, in Europe under the, the current conditions? And sure. sometimes you do hear there's this anxiety from meeting Europe that says the politicians just don't get it. Uh, is, is it overblown or is there a fair case to say there's a real concern that in 30 years a lot of this is gone? Well, I think for some very energy intensive companies, it's difficult. It's difficult, that is for sure. So there we have to be realistic. And that's as well what, what everybody in the room thinks, but nobody dares to say. Maybe we go too fast. Maybe we go too fast and maybe we have to relax a little bit because otherwise maybe some of the companies are going to disappear and they're not going to come back. And maybe we're going to have a backlash from the public as well. And once you have that backlash, 
yeah, then you're going to have a big problem to 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 do this um, yeah, to do this change to do this uh, transition this climate transition because it's like the the yellow hashes that you had a couple of years in France. It wasn't much. It was a little bit an increase in in, in diesel uh, tax, but but it has made that that they had to retrieve completely on on the plans that they made. So I think that maybe. To be a little bit more realistic and to say, okay, if we see that all the other countries are not moving as fast, maybe we should, yeah, I don't say backtrack, but we should be a little bit more realistic. For that, um, well, a lot has been said and, and, and done here, but I wonder if there's anything, uh, Helga, that you want to uh, add to what you've heard. And there's a question that I want to ask you because you dedicate a, a whole chapter to this in the report, which has to do with uh, wages and this idea potentially of a wage spiral that continues and then it hinders the actions of the central bank and, and the entire effort over the past year. But the question that I want to ask you is when you go to governments and you pitch this recommendation of solutions, is it realistic to you when you know that they also respond to a public opinion that objectively says all of the price increases that we've saw over the past year have become structural? My life is not better off than it was a year ago. And for me, I do feel like I do need more money that has to come through through wages. Otherwise, my life is not better off. It's a very delicate balance. So how would you pitch it in a way that works? To, to, to. <laughs> To keep you at the edge of your seat, I'll answer this one last. Um, um, but uh, you know, a very, very good question for all of us in the policy advising business. Um, Xavier, um, you you very helpfully pointed out that we're making policy decisions without knowing an awful lot about where things are going. Right? It's much easier to speak when uh, we are in a regular business cycle on the way up, on the way down. Turning points are hard, but this is much harder. This is more than a turning point. You know, people have used words like crossroads. Um, this is a moment of, of of great uncertainty. So what do we do? Well, we, we have to be certain uh, that our policy advice works under different scenarios. And just to re-emphasize two points that I think um, all of us um, agree, but you know, just to make uh, clear where, where we stand as well. Um, the risk to inflation is um, just like the risk um, um, to, uh, um, always is two-sided, right? We, we may have uh, much higher inflation than we currently have. We may have lower inflation than we currently have. We are forecasting. We are not, you know, we don't know what will be uh, happening uh, next month or next quarter or even next year. So we do our best to predict. Uh, we give advice um, that should, however, be um, robust two um, errors on both sides. And there, um, as you heard Stefan explain, um, our conviction is that that, there, that the two risks are not equal. The upside inflation is surprised, the downside inflation is surprised with regard to their economic cost. They're not. If you err on the downside, fantastic. Uh, you get quicker to your goals. Um, um, that's very helpful. But imagine you err on the upside. Um, inflation is higher than you expect. Um, if you let your guard down, if you if you um, ease monetary policy too fast, um, uh, you will end up um, with inflation expectations reacting to this. This is more important in some countries than others. Um, the others include um, uh, countries with strong hist uh, history and institutional um, wage indexation. And um, you know, in such situations, um, uh, the central bank may have to step up again and uh, um, tighten um, after premature loosening. Um, that's a big mistake. Uh, that is costly. Uh, that is what um, history tells us. Um, uh, you have to be uh, you have to be very vigilant and see this inflation through before you um, before you go there. That said, you know, the world may change. And so we're very happy that uh, central banks such as the ECB, but also others have moved to a data driven approach or a meeting by meeting approach. You've heard all these words, which basically mean, well, we got to look and see. Um, we understand that we're, we should be asymmetric in our reaction. Upside surprises to inflation uh, are more costly. But, you know, if you have a substantive change in the inflation path, let's consider what this means for monetary policy. That's the right way to do it. Fiscal policy, same thing. Uncertainty is tremendously high. But if we have learned one thing is that if uh, a shock that we by definition haven't anticipated hits the economy, we better have the fiscal space to react. This is what countries did, right? This is how Europe got through the pandemic. This is how Europe reacted to the energy crisis. And it was fantastic that Europe was in a position um, more or less across countries with a lot of help also um, from central borrowing arrangements and so on to step up 
and to uh, do something about it. So we need to be in that position again if that next shock comes. So uncertainty, we don't know what the next shock will be, but it will come. I, uh, if we've learned one thing in the in, at the IMF is that um, it, there's always another thing that you don't expect. And so you want to be ready. So fiscal consolidation now helps you to rebuild these fiscal buffers. So um, let's do it. Um, now on the um, structural reform question, I, mean, I think we all agree we got to we, we, you know, this is important. Medium term growth is important um, and we need to um, we need to do something about it. I'm, and I'm totally with you when you say, um, uh, you know, there um, I, I don't like to use this word, but there may be red tape in Europe. We may be slow in um, because we have many regulatory layers that uh, that can complicate things. And and so, you know, one way to look at this is say, you know, what did we do during the crisis? All of Europe both at the central and at the national level, was very proactive, very strong, very agile in our policy reaction. That was fantastic. That is what got the continent through the, uh, the these, these double crises fast. So, so, you know, some of that spirit should be applied to the medium term growth challenge. But, um, you know, whether um, that means we um, we should go easier on the green transition, I really don't know, uh, because I think, um, uh, you know, this is about managing that transition. We all agree that it's a good thing. So there's a way of doing this with the right structural policies that um, um, that doesn't mean we have to slow down. Now, um, how do <laughs> what's exactly our our wage message and how to communicate this to policymakers who look at um, the wage real wage losses that means you know wages being um, in terms of their growth rate outrun by inflation and say what do we do so we we, we are we it's very important uh, um, to to understand that that we hope and we assume in our forecast that real wages um, will catch up um, across the continent um, this forecast is built on the basis of assuming rather strong nominal wage growth in advanced economies and emerging markets going forward in such a way that there will be some catch up um, actually substantive catch up um, of um, of wages and real incomes um, you know based uh, you know making good some of the losses that came from past um, uh, price inflation outrunning wage inflation um, so so that's built in without this we don't have that recovery that Stefan talked about uh, for the eurozone might this year we predict 0.7 percent then a mild recovery to 1.2 percent next year that is built on the premise that real incomes will increase that will support consumption that will ultimately generate growth and um, so that's important however you know, uh, growth um, of wages could be even faster than what we're assuming. And there's a point where uh, wages grow too fast um, for inflation to also come down simultaneously by 2025. So it's a matter of balance. Um, um, but uh, we, we think the message to policymakers is um, you can have that real wage adjustment, you can have a mild recovery, and you can have um, uh, inflation going down to uh, targets by 2025. But, you know, be careful to get your macro policy is right um, both fiscal and monetary policy but also you know start looking towards structural policies and be be as agile and, and strong and proactive about it as you were during the crisis they are being active and, and proactive and agile i wonder there, there there there's there's always room for, room for improvement well and on that note um now it's time to uh questions from the audience if you have um any questions, then just uh, this is the time. If not, I, I can continue, but it would be good to hear from you if anyone has any. I'm sure you have, but it's the first question that's always tough. So um, before we, yes? Oh. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, because this is important in, in, in this context, I wonder, can, can you explain maybe the three of you can also do this because i think this is what a lot of people uh wonder you talked about this this not just up and down cycle but maybe perhaps an entire change in in the paradigm what does it mean this whole idea in simple terms of higher for longer interest rates what does it mean to be and operate in a world uh as individual but also companies governments you talked about the cost of uh, this debt potentially also in crescendo refinancing it what does it mean now how is it different now to perhaps the 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 false normal that we thought we were in now if you do change into this scenario where this becomes the new normal if you believe it will be the new normal now 
I'm tempted to ask uh, Xavi, but then he will say he cannot speak to interest rates, um, so I won't. Um, I, I, I don't know what, what is normal. It depends a little bit on your time uh, perspective. Um, so, you know, we, we, we certainly think that eventually interest rates will fall as they tend to do when uh, the economy sort of uh, um, goes from an expansion to, to a slowdown. So that will happen eventually. We, you know, on, on, under our baseline, we think uh, interest rates um, will be uh, uh, starting to fall um, towards the end or after the end of 2024 for many countries. In some countries, it is already starting now, so it depends a little bit on where you are. But so, so you know, um, interest rates uh, will not uh, remain at that level um, forever, obviously. Um, but um, for the time being, they are high. Um, I think for corporates and um, um, and sovereigns, uh, we have higher debt services cost, and so it's time to face that reality. That investment slows down a little is is intended. Uh, we also need to make sure that fiscal policy um, sort of uh, understands uh, where we are, and so uh, these fiscal policy makers need not, need not only react to higher debt servicing costs, um, they also have to react to the fact that there's higher spending needs going forward for the green transition, defense spending in a lot of countries. Um, uh, so they're, they're, they're other obligations um, that are waiting and for this you need to prepare. So you need to put the fiscal path um, on a solid footing and uh, the interest rates are just one of the reasons uh, why this is urgent at the moment. Not to get into rates because I know you're not going to do it, but but even more perhaps on a on an intellectual basis. I mean, you, you're talking about a a whole scenario that changes. A lot of people perhaps believed or thought is very low interest rates, negative rates. That world perhaps was exceptional. Is not going to be the new normal. That triggers a whole rethinking in how you see uh, the world. I, I guess that's more of a where my question was going beyond the specific number. Well, here I will only observe. One thing mm -hmm. that, that struck me in the in the presentation of the report is that uh, the IMF continues to assume that for most advanced economies uh, in Europe, actually uh, you just need uh, a 1% primary budget deficit to stabilize public debt. Uh, and if that's the case, that must mean that you assume that interest rates will remain mm -hmm. significantly or permanently or I don't know, or for a long time below the growth rate, uh, which is something I, I, I'm, 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 I'm puzzled a little bit. I mean, that you assume low rates and reasonably high growth, or at least growth that is above the right. rates. So uh, so that's, uh, that's an issue. So now if we move to uh, permanently higher interest rates, well, uh, it is, it, well, you know, I mean, th this is just the usual balance that we need to achieve between savings and investment. Mm -hmm. Everybody is saying, well, we need massive increases in investment in order to be able to, uh, you know, deal with uh, climate transition, we to deal with a number of, um, you know, investments that absolutely need to be made at the private level. I mean, you know, if we, if the government tells me you need to give up on your fuel uh, furnace, uh, and buy a heat pump, well, it's costing a lot of money and I'm going to borrow that money. And so so you have a, a, an increase in, in investment needs. And on the other side, what do you have? Well, you have people who are aging mm -hmm. and uh, when they age a lot, they really retire at the end of the day. They are not at the end of their uh, saving cycle, uh, you know, where you save a lot to be able to preserve your consumption. But when you actually retire, in principle, you should not save anymore. And so, as demographics is evolving, uh, I'm not sure you you would uh, you would uh, see these uh, saving glut, as we sometimes described it, that is excess saving, and we don't know what to do with it, and this drives interest rates down. So I think you need to think also about the structural determinants of uh, real interest rates in in the longer term. And what I see, I may be wrong, but I see. Uh, a lot of investment needs and and I cannot see savings going much further and it if anything it should decline so interest rates should naturally increase uh, and it's a, it's a it's a it's a normal balancing act and I'm not concerned about uh, markets playing its role uh, but yes well, thank you for that and uh, Shaver just said something also uh, very um, interesting which also goes back to the question that you presented before which had to do with sometimes we say we need to invest so much and there's all those things that Europe needs to do to be competitive uh, in the future some will say 
there's already money that could be used. Maybe there's a question of value for money and economic governance uh, in it. Before that, you also said when you look at what the United States is doing with the IRA, it's not in amounts of money, perhaps more significantly more than what the European Union has mobilized in different ways. So that is difficult to understand for some people who may say if the amounts are the same, if there isn't an issue per se of funding and resources for a lot of this investment, then why are we not seeing bigger productivity gains? and bigger competitiveness as a block? Well, uh, I don't understand your question very, very good, but uh, I think I think and to the point, a lot of people say mm. uh, it's not a question of the investment requires funding. And if this idea of there has been money that has been put on the table mm. in Europe that you've seen it in the past, we've also said in overall amounts, the Inflation Reduction Act, and you said it before, uh, it's amounts that perhaps are not fully matched in the same way by Europe, but it doesn't mean that Europe has not mobilized mm. resources. And in the report, however, there is this consistent call to increase uh, productivity to increase competitiveness in Europe. We know it's a massive debate in the Commission, and there's a report that Mario Draghi is going to present soon. Then if all of this is on the table, why are we not seeing it? What's preventing this? Before you talked about rent and another number of issues, but at one point you also have to wonder, is it value for money? Is it about economic governance too? No, but I think it's economic governance. I think it's just, yeah, okay. Uh, we are not the United States of Europe, and that's an all different ballgame. Uh, you, are, you are the United States of Europe, but uh, as, as was pointed out here as well, we don't have really a single market. We have, yeah, we start to have a single market for products, but we certainly don't have a single market for services. So as long as you don't have that, yeah, you're going to see that the productivity increases is lower than the productivity increases and the productivity in the United States. And certainly goes for the service sector. If you just see the banking sector, uh, the regulations in Italy are totally different than the regulations in Belgium and, and, and things that you have to do uh, being a big bank, like, for example, BNP Paribas. Yeah, okay, to make synergies, the same synergies like you can do uh, as GP Morgan can do in the United States are totally different. So I think that is the main issue. And, and, and indeed, uh, as the IMF points out, if we, we still have so much fruits, like low fruits to reap for the for the single market to 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 increase productivity. And and it's indeed uh, mind boggling, I think they say in English, why this is not done and why this hasn't been done for the last 20 years. But I think that the, that that will be my answer to your question. To boost it and 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 use it more. A lot of politicians also say that. Repeatedly, the idea of a, the single market is the biggest thing that Europe has. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and still it doesn't it doesn't go forward. That is that is yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why. And uh, unless anyone has any questions, we're approaching the the end of the session. So, yes, go ahead. The gentleman at the back. <clears throat> yeah, um, just regarding you, uh, you know the. The, this this kind of like regular call that's made by central banks and you know the IMF for uh, quick agreement or, uh, on new EU fiscal rules. Um, I mean there are different visions you know on the table and this is why it's taking so long, right? Um, you've got like the sudden view of uh, the need for more flexibility on investment, particularly like long-term investment in climate, defence all the rest of it, um, and then you have the more strict, frugal German view. Um, I mean, I think I'd just like to hear you like spell out what you think. I mean, if you do think there are significant macroeconomic uh, differences in outcomes between these different different views, um, or, I mean, where would you like to see the balance between those two very different models? Xavier, I promise I bring you in. Um, this um, 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 excellent, excellent question. Thank you. Um, uh, well, we have a one. There's a at a very um, basic level. Certainty here is important. Um, many governments uh, across the membership of the EU are waiting for these new guidelines, and uh, those may not be the large economies that you hear about in the media, but the others. Um, are eager to have clarity on these frameworks, which have served uh, these countries well as an external anchor for the domestic uh, fiscal policies. So, so that, that that's a very basic uh, comment. We 
we generally sort of appreciate the uh, way the uh, Commission has moved the discussion towards a more risk based, less rigid uh, approach. But of course, there's also an important uh, concern about um, um, safeguards uh, with regard to what it means for high debt countries and so on. So we need to we need to have some of the structure that is now being discussed. Um, we're looking forward for this um, to be finalized soon um, uh, because I don't think the alternatives are as attractive as finding a compromise. Now, in terms of the fundamental needs that these countries are trying to serve here, I think all of these countries will benefit from a clear medium term framework. Um, I think uh, that entails um, um, you know, an idea of, of how to discipline fiscal policy. And I think the focus on expenditure um, is a good one. It's a pragmatic one. Um, all these countries have a need for investment. Um, and, um, and so taking into account how investment uh, will impact growth, uh, how that in turn will impact debt sustainability is a good way of doing this, but not every investment is equally um, uh, qualified to uh, lift uh, growth. So one has to have a uh, approach that is um, a little bit country by country. And so we, we hope that, you know, that we think that's a useful part of the conversation as well. And in for the general need of investment in Europe, right, um, that, then we suddenly go way beyond um, the fiscal framework, right? This is um, this is the question of uh, how useful we think uh, the use of EU funds has been and is going to be to facilitate public investment and uh, structural reforms in countries. And we are uh, we think uh, we are in the camp that uh, this is indeed a very good way of uh, using uh, uh, joint resources within the EU. We uh, think uh, focus uh, you know, along the lines of the next generation EU and so on programs in at the country level is very urgent. So, but but there I, I would I would say but once we get to investment, uh, the topic is a little bit larger than than the SGP reform. Now, Xavi, um, we're curious. Uh, well, I mean, uh, why do we have fiscal rules, uh, by the way? I mean, uh, apparently uh, in your the financial community, it was below the radar. Nobody really understood why actually uh, or that actually there was a debate on on, on, on fiscal rules uh, because fiscal is not an issue after all. Uh, well, yes, actually it is an issue because uh, what we what we know and what we have known for a long time is that uh, financial responsibility is not exactly wired into the way fiscal policy is actually uh, designed and implemented. So you need rules when you share a common currency, you need rules uh, that are also shared by all the different governments to make sure that, uh, you know, at some point they wouldn't be in such a bad situation that they would have to rely on some kind of central bank bailout or help. So this is this is a precondition for monetary stability in a currency union. You need shared rules and these fiscal rules need to uh, ensure that indeed that sustainability uh, is uh, the law of the land in all of the different jurisdictions of, of the monetary union. So that, that that's basically why we have those fiscal rules It's not to have permanent austerity or anything like that. And indeed the call to rebuild buffers is exactly about that. It's about the fact that you want every single government in the union to continue to be able to issue debt. That's the purpose of debt sustainability. It's not because the IMF wants it or our central bankers like it. No, it's because it's great for a government to be able to issue debt when it needs to. And for that, people need to expect and people in the, the markets and the, the general public need to expect some sense of responsibility uh, from the government. Otherwise, if confidence is lost, you cannot issue debt anymore. So now uh, the Commission has indeed, uh, you know, uh, proposed uh, a number of modifications to uh, to the existing fiscal rules. And as usual, I mean, it's one of my one of my favorite movies, so I use it all the time. There is the good, there is the bad, and there is the ugly. Uh, the good is that indeed there is a debt anchor, so really the the fiscal framework should focus mostly on debt sustainability. There is a risk-based approach. There is a medium-term uh, orientation. This is all music to the ears of uh, you know economists who uh, like myself uh, enjoy studying uh, fiscal policy. Uh, there is also uh, not only a debt anchor, but that debts 
that objective is actually implemented, operationalized through expenditure rules. Now, there is less good or bad. I mean, there is something that is good in principle, but bad in practice, which is this idea to actually, uh, you know, account for the fact that countries would somehow commit to uh, make more public investment or uh, structural reforms. And then, OK, you commit to do that and we give you seven years to adjust your debt to the objective instead of four years. Uh, this is dangerous. Um, and um, in practice, uh, I don't see how it can happen in a politicized environment, because let's not forget that this is the European Council and basically the Senate, uh, if you want to make a US analogy, that actually uh, decides on uh, implementing the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, so uh, what I don't like either is to put the DSA somehow at the center of the, sorry, the debt sustainability analysis framework uh, at the center uh, of everything. I mean, the, that, that kind of tool is really a risk assessment tool. It should not be used as a calibration uh, tool to uh, tell uh, governments you're going to make that effort next year and that much effort the year after and so on and so forth. And there is the ugly. Uh, which is what we are seeing now. The debate is extremely politicized because some and different governments see different things in this uh, commission proposal. Uh, and uh, you have now, uh, you know, politically motivated arguments uh, to introduce more complexities into the system while you know, a key idea behind the reform was to simplify the system uh, and basically to get rid of this incomprehensible, except for maybe half a dozen people uh, in Brussels, one of them is in the room, uh, who understands really uh, what, what, what this all means. But the idea was to get rid of the preventive arm of the SGP. And now uh, the political debate is going into re-establishing or reintroducing minimum benchmarks for adjustments and so on and so forth. And this is all very, uh, very complicated uh, at the end of the day. And so we miss completely this uh, objective to make the system more transparent uh, and more understandable uh, for not only governments, but also for the general public. And you need general public support uh, for these rules ultimately uh, uh, to work. So uh, let's see what uh, what it will uh, boil, boil down to. But um, I'm confident, I'm still confident there will be a political deal. Uh, but uh, the rule that will come out of that uh, will look more uh, like, uh, you know, Frankenstein rather than George Clooney. <laughs> and, and some of the things you said you, you didn't like is what some governments say they like. So uh, still, you, you still say you, 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 you just to reflect everyone's views, uh, you still say, however, that you see a, 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 a deal done. When is this going to get done? Because today there's a Euro group. It's understood nothing's going to happen. And then we push it to December. Then you get to the first half of the year and then it's European elections. And then after that, it's goodbye until it sits again. So when is this going to happen, do you think? And what happens if there isn't one? Because the head of the ECB already said it has to get done before the end of the year. Yeah, it has to get done before the end but of the year. Realistically, is that going to happen? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is some kind of, you know, landing zone that mm -hmm. has been agreed upon. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, uh, it will be, it's, it's kind of a, uh, War. Because then it becomes it's kind of a, a war of attrition. You see, I mean, you, you don't want to be perceived as the one who will give finally give up. But at some point, you know, things stars will have to align because what is the fallback solution? The fallback solution is going back to the old rules that mm -hmm. nobody like. Uh, or maybe some like those rules, but uh, but that would mean that uh, you know in the in the in the spring the Commission is going to start looking at the countries that are above three percent deficit. Yes, and we're going to say, oh my God, we're we're back to 2010, and we're going to have like uh, you know massive fiscal contractions everywhere. Is this really what we want? Uh, is this really the spirit of this new uh, reform where you really want to have uh, a debt anchor? Uh, a medium term orientation, uh, some gradual uh, adjustment going on, some intelligence in the design of fiscal policies uh, in line with the rules. Uh, we're not going to have that. We're going to have brute force. Um, so it is a real macro risk because it was somehow under the radar, but you know. It could be. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh, Jean-Luc, you have a meeting today. So you're going to be silent with me. 
Uh, and then uh, we need to now bring it to, to an end, but I wonder uh, if you have a final thought, final word that you want to uh, perhaps complete uh, your views expressed today. This is the time to do, and then after that, we can all go into the, the coffee and tea session and, and wrap this day, which I think has been very productive. But this is your last uh, opportunity if you want to say something to circle all your thoughts. I, uh, I think we have circled our thoughts and um, I appreciate the discussion and uh, thank you very much. Um, good panel. Thank you so much and thank you also for the report of the IMF. And then this concludes uh, the session. And as I said, now we can all uh, have a coffee and, and, and tea and our panelists. Thank you so much. Round of applause and they will also join us.